everyone. My name is Katrin Schechtman, and I work for Lightband. Um, please don't be scared by my title. I'm scared by myself. So being enterprise architect at Lightband, it's something else. And um, is, there is no correlation between my talk and being enterprise architect. Actually, Lightband does not support ScalaGS. It's something that I have to say because um, there are people and there are organizations who actually would like to get support for it and Lightband does not provide it. But generally speaking, it's a very good support from the community and from uh, EPFL. So uh, let's talk about ScalaGS. Why I can talk about it pragmatically? Because I was working on a project uh, as a real world scenario for eight months, um, employing ScalaGS on the client side. And I have some of the things to share with you. Let's see if it will be beneficial. So um, what's the deal of ScalaGS? Why we want it? Usually um, talks about ScalaGS and all the things around it. Um, there is many, many slides that we're talking about how JavaScript uh, doesn't um, play along with uh, its developers and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about too much. Um, the opposite, I'd like to talk about how ScalaGS is uh, good for us. So the main reason of using ScalaGS, it's actually people can develop web applications, which historically and nowadays have to be uh, implemented with JavaScript without actually having to write JavaScript. And it's a big thing. Now, there are other uh, kind of uh, frameworks or languages, I, uh, I'm not sure how to call them, that exist and you can do the same, for example, TypeScript, maybe Clojure on some other stuff. But um, ScalaGS uh, seems to be, and from my own experience as well, it's very, very flexible. It's very, very stable, despite of the, the fact that right now it's 0.6.13. And the community that supports it, it's very small, but it's also very, very active. So as I go through my slides, I probably I'll talk to it as well. So if you'd like to start with ScalaGS, before we continue, can, can you please raise your hands, whoever heard about ScalaGS? Just Oh, that's great. Who heard about it and actually know what I'm talking about? That's what I thought. Okay, so hopefully this talk will be beneficial. So how you start with ScalaGS? So first and for the most, actually, it's, uh, it's not any different from employing any new technology. You need to know what you need it for. You need to know your requirements because if you don't get your requirements right, you actually you bound to uh, to do things that maybe more complex way or things that you don't need to or the way that it's actually it's not uh, correct. So what what would be the typical questions to ask if you would like to start with um, ScalaGS? So apart obviously you need ScalaGS because you have some sort of uh, web development because if you're server side if you're backend. You're not going to do ScalaGS just to deploy it to Node so you can run it on backend. It's not the way, right? So what's the questions? So first of all, you need to see if you want to develop only uh, uh, for, for web. If there is nothing shared between kind of your server layer and your client layer. The next thing it will be to ask once again, it's a little bit the um, question A and question B, those are completing questions, but it's uh, important to understand because it's just reiterating the importance of these questions. Is any of your code is going to be shared between client and server? Now, of course, it's always a good idea to share data types, for example, between uh, a client and server. The question is if you can. There are organizations over there that might decide that you can do your thing with ScalaGS, but um, uh, still to the server, they will prefer to run it on um, some other weird technology that it's not JVM based. So it might be yes or might be no. Uh, question number C, <laughs> question, the third question would be, if you are planning to have any JVM based clients, uh, while the Java clients are not as um, uh, popular anymore, I might talk about Android client that you can actually uh, consume your Java artifacts from ScalaGS project as part of your Android client. And even Java can run on iOS, despite of the fact that um, people usually tend to trust Java on Android and less on iOS. And the last but not the least, it's who 
within your project is going to be responsible for UI development? It's a very, very important question because this question will uh, make or break how you deal with ScalaJS. Why is that? Because there is two different um, semantically and fundamentally different ways of doing ScalaJS and I'll show what it means. So after we answered uh, the questions that we outlined before, or at least we ask them so we can go and see what we can and what we cannot do in our projects, we would go and see what actually ScalaJS can provide us. And the, it's very important to understand the limits, like the strengths and weaknesses of ScalaJS, right? It's, it's, it can do everything, it can bake a, a cake, but it totally can make your life easier not to dealing with JavaScript. So there are mainly four different features or options that exist in ScalaJS. The first one, if you want to write Scala, then compile it to JavaScript, not to see it again, not to go to, to open your JavaScript file and run it as is in your browser, that's fine, you can do it, right? It's the first option, you just compile it and you don't go, you don't touch it by any other means, only deploy it in your browser and it somehow runs magically. The second option is actually to say that you're developing part of your application uh, in ScalaJS and you export ki some kind of APIs from your JavaScript. Those APIs will be consumed by other JavaScript-based layers. Whether those layers will be developed by you or by uh, some other front-end developers, it's another question to ask. But technically speaking, you can export and you someone else or you in other head can consume it. The third option is actually to bring some JavaScript existing library and to wrap it. It's called Facade. And then you actually can use whatever uh, uh, facility or whatever library there is existing in JavaScript and reusing it within uh, ScalaJS. Why it's important? Because, of course, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? If you're doing ScalaJS, you don't want to go and uh, reinvent WebSocket, for example, or any other kind of uh, commodity capabilities that already exist in JavaScript or DOM capabilities in this sense. So all the things that exist in JavaScript can be wrapped in facades and brought back to ScalaJS to work on it within Scala code. The fourth and pretty the least in this case you can have, um, if you have JavaScript-based class, you can bring it back, and I'm saying back because we want to focus on Scala, you can bring it back to ScalaJS, enrich it, and then send it back to use it by JavaScript. Um, it has, in, at least in my eyes and from my experience, a little bit um, narrow uh, uh, usage, I haven't used it too much, so I'd like to focus actually on first three as this talk goes on. So remember the questions A, B, C, D. So the first question was, if you're developing for web only, okay? Now, if the answer for this question was yes, then the typical steps of how you proceed will be, you will go and you will uh, import ScalaJS plugin in build.sbt. You will write some ScalaJS code. You will run it via two different methods, whether it's SBT run or fastopt.js. We will see what it means. And you will probably want to learn where your JavaScript output is because you want to do something with this JavaScript output, right? You want to put it in a browser and run it. So in this case, if you're using it this way, you don't have server component, you don't have Scala GVM component, you have only web only component. So the, uh, uh, the outputs will be in target, Scala version for whatever it is, 2.11, 2.12, then the project name that you assign it in build.sbt and fast object.js. There is also full object.js. Uh, we are not going to cover it in the talk, but once again, um, I'd like to, to have this talk light and giving directions of what I saw, uh, what I saw how people work with ScalaJS, and you um, totally can go and read full tutorials, and uh, uh, they can explain it much better than me in 40 minutes. 
So should you choose that you're developing for web only, you should go full full tutorial that uh, exists on uh, scalajs.org, right? It's a, a legit um, tutorial from the others. Okay, now I would advise you if you go to scalajs.org, you'll see that there is of right now there are three tutorials, um, the basic, uh, the full and spa tutorial. The, the second and the third are very, very comprehensive. They're full and a lot of details. I would encourage you to go and to read first the basic tutorial. It will give you a, a heads up, a good start in understanding how it works. And from now, uh, from there on, you can actually go and read the more, um, the fuller tutorials. Now, if the answer for your questions A was no, which means it's kind of a, a answer for B or C was yes, it means that you are planning to share some of the code between JavaScript and JVM. What it means? It means that just, uh, uh, you have your web server or your application server, right? Even if it's play. Um, and you have your single page application, which is JavaScript. Those are not templates that are being generated on the play. For whatever reasons, those are requirements. What you cannot do, you cannot share your data types. You have to, to say, you can kind of share it through JSON uh, um, um, data structures and hope for good that it does not change over the time or to put some kind of good versioning in place to make sure that both sides talk about the same thing. Now, with Scala.js, it is not so anymore. What you can do, you actually can have your case classes, and those will be shared between your Scala code running in the browser and your Scala code running in JVM. It's, it's, it's huge, it's, it's, it's really good. Now, the way to tackle it, you would go and employ a little bit different feature of Scala.js SBT plugin, which is called cross-project. People tend to confuse between those two, not understanding when to use one or another. So just to remember, if you're doing only web, only client, you can go with the regular one, just enable the plugin. If you want to share your code, you have to deal with a little bit more complex feature, which is called cross-project. You will have GS, project, you will have GVM project, you will, you will manage them separately through this feature. Once again, in this case, you will write some code, either in shared part or in GVM part or in GS part, because you're going to have three parts. And then, once again, you will able to run it the same thing, SBT run or fast op GS. Those guys actually run the thing on the client, um, SBT run runs node that should be installed on your system. SBT fast OBGS, it just compiles your JavaScript and you can take this JavaScript and put somewhere to view it or to, to, to use it in any other sense. In this case, the output will reside in a little bit different directory. As I said, there are going to be three parts. Shared, GVM, and GS. In this case, your first opt.js, the output, the JavaScript output file will be in GS part of the target. I mean, it's not GS part of the target, it's a target part of GS project, which is a little bit differently. Now, if you would like to go further and explore how it works, um, there is an excellent skeleton project that also resides on um, uh, scalages.org website. I would advise you to go for full tutorials that I created. And it's actually based on this example, it has eight simple uh, steps, each one of them a tag within a, a GitHub repository that shows the steps, what you can do with it. For example, first, SBT plugin, putting into build it SBT. Second, writing some code. Third, bringing some DOM dependencies. Fourth, trying to see how it will work with React locally. Then a server will come along. So I would uh, encourage you to check it out. Now, the next question, as I said, and this question is uh, of the most importance. Uh, who is going to be responsible for UI? What does it mean? We are already talking about client code. There is a big difference between client code and UI, and it can be divided into two. Uh, whoever is doing so, um, front-end developers tend to do both. They're writing UI components, 
with help of frameworks such as React or Angular or what's not Backbone, um, or maybe jQuery, or maybe doing it native with DOM, which doesn't happen a lot lately. But um, they also write the business logic, whatever business logic it has to be on the client side. And as we will go further into the talk, I can show you that Scala GS actually can enable your team to operate in a mode that business logic is side and UI representation is side. The question is if you can allow yourself within your project boundaries with your team, with your managers, and whatever constraints you have with your organization. Now, but before we're going there, what does it mean to be responsible for UI? You could do direct DOM manipulation, as we said, jQuery, React, and what's not. With Scology specifically, there is very, very new framework, which is called UDash. And this UDash, it actually aims to be a React of the Scology's world, which means everything, um, all the views and all the control is on all the things that we might be familiar for React or AngularJS, they are native to Scology's with UDash. It's very, very new. Um, the version is something like 0.2, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, I'm not sure that it's uh, ready for production, but it's a great start. And once again, the community is uh, very active. So hopefully soon it will be uh, something that we can enjoy in production. <coughs> the last but not the least, uh, you could write your own framework. Um, I kind of assume that uh, the fifth point does not come along um, at great terms with being pragmatic. So there is nothing to say about it anymore. Now, we said that we kind of uh, uh, decided with um, going only with web or going with uh, 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 shared code. Now, the question is if testing is going to be h harmed or it's going to be easier or harder in which one of the cases. And maybe with ScalaJS it's actually uh, hard to, to, to test as uh, JavaScript has its uh, Jasmine and some other frameworks which maybe I was lazy enough to get into. I tried when I had to, when I was a kind of full stack developer. You remember the times a couple of years ago when being full stack developer was a thing. And if you wanted to find another job, the only thing that you needed to do to put some on your resume, full stack developer. So um, it was a time of um, um, backend people trying to grasp uh, Jasmine as a full, uh, a uh, full-fledged test framework. I don't know, I couldn't, I didn't manage. In this case, when I uh, started to working with Scala.js and um, Scala test is uh, fully supported there, it's amazing, seriously. It's it just, it's, it's whatever Scala test can provide you, only for both JVM and uh, JavaScript including futures, um, including everything, including Scala check. I have these points throughout the talk just reiterating, Scala test is amazing, Scala test is amazing. So, um, not only uh, you could do unit testing in this case, uh, of course, as um, usually is project, as we start the project, we as a developer say, we will have 100% of unit testing. And only then, and only then we will start with um, integration testing. Soon enough, the only thing that we do is integration testing because integration testing covers much more, so why do I need unit testing at all? Now, having said that, we need both, and fortunately, um, Scala.js supports both. Um, and it's an interesting point. Um, when, for this project that I mentioned before, um, I had to, um, to create tests, uh, there was not um, a native, uh, seamless way of uh, support integration testing. So um, I had to become a little bit of SBT guru to start support, uh, to, to, to support it uh, because I needed to understand how Scala.js plugin, SBT plugin works and why it does not pick up IT directories. Um, so um, the dog project testing.html, it's actually an effort that came out of it. Uh, the only reason that I'm actually, that I'm mentioning it, um, if you will feel that after you started to working with Scala.js that there are some gotchas or something that you can do easier, 
don't be afraid or scared uh, try to contribute the guys who are responsible for uh, scholarship they are they may be not easy going but they're very 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 reasonable and um, as I went through process of vetting this um, uh, testing uh, page on the scholarGS.org, it was actually a very nice experience. I was a little bit scared, but it, it went just nice, and I got LG looking good to me, LG TM, um, after thorough review pretty quickly. So the next thing that's being supported as well is Scala Check, which is great. Uh, you can use it. Um, um, it's great. Now, um, when this JavaScript is, uh, uh, is being run, you can have uh, uh, um, three different engines that you can employ. It could be Phantom, it could be Node or Selenium. Obviously, Node does not support HTML. So once you want to check your HTML representation, it has to be Phantom. And I'm not sure even about Selenium. I think Selenium uh, it, uh, supports both, but uh, personally, I haven't used Selenium. I've used both uh, Node and Phantom. Phantom has a little bit of their gotchas. Uh, for example, it's not easy to deliver an um, environment variable to Phantom. And if you would like to configure your tests with environment variables, once again, you have to, to have a little bit of SBT Kung Fu and to um, extend Phantom uh, GS and uh, settings within Scala GS SBT plugin. But once again, it's not such a big deal. It's just uh, common sense. There are also other testing framework exists, such as U-Test. Uh, those are lightweight. I haven't used them because I, seriously, as I said, Scala test is amazing, but you can uh, try them uh, should you decide to do so. Now, about debugging. Yeah, it's uh, another question that I get a lot when I uh, get to speak about ScalaGS and my experience on this project. And by the way, we will talk about the project, but I can't give too many details because it was a US-based client and he preferred to be confidential. So I will talk about my experiences and not what exactly they do. Anyways, um, about debugging. So there are a couple of different ways to debug um, ScalaGS code. First of all, uh, and it's everything around making it much easier for turning around your code, your changes, and to see the results, the output. So first of all, if you use FastOpJS with tilde, it becomes a continuous compilation, which means if you go, you change your code, by the time that you get to your browser, the changes is already there, you just need to refresh the browser. Should you decide that you don't want an additional click, you can use the workbench from Lihawi. Um, the guy is also uh, very, very active on all these things. A and it actually gives you live reloading. By the time that you get to the browser, you don't need to click, it's already there. And uh, the last but not the least, I use this sentence a lot. Um, browser inspectors. So once you have your code within the browser, just whatever it's Chrome or Mozilla, just open up an inspector and try to code against what you think it should be right. And you will see how it works. And by the way, because ScalaGS supports uh, uh, JavaScript maps, you actually get to the Scala line of code decompiled as you can see it within your... Um, within your ID. It's still in the browser, but it's not cryptic at all. It's a line of code that you wrote. It's about debugging. By the way, if you have questions, please ask me as we go, because by the time that we went to, uh, that we go to the end, it probably will be close enough to the lunch that you won't be, uh, won't be willing to ask those questions. Uh, about packaging, so, okay, so we have this uh, uh, JavaScript file. Whether this JavaScript file is a black box and it's, you want to run it in the browser without interacting with, uh, with it, or uh, it's a JavaScript file that someone else is going to consume some of the APIs from there, uh, you have two different uh, types of packaging. The first one, it's self-contained JavaScript. You can just toss them around you can minimize them and just to put them wherever they need. It's a little bit, a little bit uh, um, archaic way of doing things. Uh, there is another way you actually you can wrap it up in npm package and to give it to whoever uh, does the rest of the client code um, and uses npm for managing dependencies. So far so good. Okay. Now another question that I um, usually get. It's, uh, so how does it work? Okay, so I have this JavaScript file. If I will uh, run it as a file, 
column slash slash uh, it's probably it won't get me too far for all different reasons uh, for course for uh, no one does it it just doesn't work that way. So in conjunction with different application slash web browsers, how does it, does it work? So if we are talking, and I will go from the last one to the first one, um, just to make it uh, interesting. So if we are talking about Node, it means that for some reason, for some reason, you are writing code in ScalaJS for the client, but the server that you're running, it's actually Node. Okay, it happens. So, um, in case how those things will be operate, first of all, you could wrap it as NPM package and give it to, to, to your node, or if you decide to go it by different route, REST or sockets uh, uh, um, interface exists, right? It's just regular single client application versus a server which is agnostic to, it's a client agnostic to the server. Once again, with play, since play, you can share your data types. You can actually share your data types in case class kind of uh, uh, manner or case object kind of, man of manner. If not, once again, you can just talk to each other um, as earlier. Akkad HTTP, the same as play. You can share your data types or talk one to each other, okay? Now, let's talk about real-world experience. Now, I'm not sure about how many details I can give out, but the idea was that there is application with uh, millions of users, with availability of 100%, and real-time performance. Does, does it sound familiar? Okay, so it's uh, generic enough, and practically everyone nowadays does it. So hopefully I don't breach any sort of NDA. Um, I was called to this project to see if we uh, um, can enjoy from being type safe with ScalaJS and how it will work. Uh, there was me who obviously knew some new Scala to a certain extent, and there were um, internal um, developers who knew JavaScript, right? Yeah, I'm just front end, that's what, what I was looking for the front-end developers. So, so what was the outcomes? At first, actually, the first week I saw that I'm going to teach the guys ScalaJS quickly, and then we will start working from there. Uh, within a week, I understood that it's not going to happen, not only because the guys don't want to learn it, but also because the managers don't have time um, to bear this uh, uh, um, picture that we sit together, them and me, and we actually don't create any kind of output for a week or for two when we're trying to, uh, um, to get things going. So the outcomes were actually, they were they and me. In this case, in the slide, it's they, they and you. So if should we decide that there is no standard JavaScript development going on, which means we don't touch JavaScript at all, they, the front-end developers, they should become familiar and comfortable with ScalaJS, but it's not only ScalaJS, but it's also Scala. As fancy and as good as it is for JavaScript people, they don't get too easy with Scala for ScalaJS purposes. It just doesn't work that way, right? Um, for me or for you in this sense, who does know Scala, but maybe doesn't want to, to deal with all this React and AngularJS and all this JavaScript uh, things, actually it means that you need to understand front-end frameworks because if you and them do the same thing, you are a homogeneous team and everyone needs to know everything. So it's kind of all or nothing approach. It's like my way or a highway which uh, might not fit your team, and it totally didn't fit the team that I was part of. So we came to the question whether it's possible to just to cut it in the middle. The front-end guys who were passionate, for whatever it was, to make it beautiful, and I was passionate about making it correct. Um, if there is a way to actually to do whatever correct is with the Scala and whatever beautiful with um, uh, uh, UI frameworks that already exist in JavaScript, like React, Backbone, once again, I'm going over, over and over again uh, uh, over the same names. Is it possible? So 
before we talk a little bit about whether it's possible or not, why we want to take this approach, not only what I bragged before, but also um, all the heavy lifting in this case can be done in Scala. Data fetching that usually buggy in JavaScript, communications that it's even buggier, storage that the buggiest cache and stuff like that. And, um, it also gives an option to um, clearly define the APIs in the, uh, um, in the language like Scala, where it's easy to refactor, where it's easy to think about ADTs, whether to think about clear APIs, and then to feed it to JavaScript, which is uh, kind of object object, or um, how it's called, yeah. inheritance. Yeah, I, I always forget. Prototype-based inheritance, yes. So, um, Error handling in Scala, it's, it's not like super B versus Java. Java in JavaScript, it just it does not kind of exist. Yeah, refactoring, just try to refactor something in JavaScript. It's <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah, it just, it's just not there. And um, one more thing that you are getting, even the uh, rest of the team who are not familiar with Scala at first, they will naturally start moving towards Scala because they will see that whatever API you create for them, they somehow never break. Somehow they always deliver the promise and within the constraints and they're very, very efficient in what's not. At some point in time, inevitably, they will ask you what you have done, how we've done it so it never breaks. And they will come and see the code and the rest will be the history. So did it work for me or not? It worked big time. Why it worked big time? Because first of all, and it was, it was amazing, it was shivering. I could do everything asynchronously. I know that in JavaScript there is not exactly asynchronous, but I don't care. It's like an actor, it's illusion. It's illusion that I've got that I do everything asynchronously. I could use futures, and even across the boundaries, when I had to return something to, um, to my peers, on the front end, they asked me to return them promise, and I could it because this functionality exists. I could, if I needed to, to provide them something and it already existed in JavaScript, I didn't have to, um, to waste my time on re-implementing it. I just could wrap it and use the JavaScript existing library, no problem. For example, I could use WebSockets, I could use user agents should I decide to gather some information about uh, the system I'm running on, and so on and so forth. Um, the APIs were just beautiful, not because I know how to do beautiful APIs, it's just because Scala gives you, it makes it easy to do it, unlike the JavaScript. And oh my God, I refactored it like all day long. Every morning that I was coming in, because it was very pressuring, it was greenfield, as the architect was very, very strict about the high standards, not only of performance, but also the cleanness of the code. Every morning, um, after the night of thinking, he would come and say, wait, I have an idea. And I'm like, yes, what, what was your idea? And it was just as easy. I, I even just, I don't want to think how it would be if it was JavaScript. So it did work. Now, about human caveats. Um, and those things, it's actually people tend to say Scala, GS, it's hard or complex or confusing. It's not hard or complex, it's confusing. It sometimes gets confusing, it's because Scala GS, you'd better to do after a good amount of sleep. That's right. But if you pay attention, it's strong. So, for example, confusing 1% with 2% with 3% and build out SBT. So who knows what 1% in build.sbt is? Yes, what is it? In build.sbt, it means if, if I have version, um, yeah, I explicitly need to say what version of uh, Scala it is, right? What about two? Yeah, so it implicitly defines the Scala version. What about three? Exactly. So three in Scala GS means that not only you bring your um, JVM-based library into the uh, uh, context. You also bring the, uh, um, it's called uh, JSIR, JavaScript, uh, Scala JS compiled version for your uh, JavaScript-based code. Now, 
Um, the problem is that not all the libraries in this world have this Scala GS based version. And it was confusing because we usually, what we do, we do, we want some library, we just bring it into the context and we forget about it. With Scala GS, you need to think twice if it's something that you actually can use in Scala GS. Because, for example, if something uses reflection, you cannot use it because the reflection is not supported by, uh, by Scala GS. By the way, um, wh why do you think Sc Scala GS, they refuse constantly to, um, to support reflection? It actually has very, very, very good reason. It will produce such a huge JavaScript that actually it will be impossible to bring. Exactly. So it makes sense. Okay. Um, and one more thing, as I mentioned before, for me at least, I uh, I can't say that I became Power SBT user because I think Power SBT user it belongs only whoever wrote SBT. But I became familiar with SBT in a way that actually I can understand what's going on right now. And it tends to be that if you work with colleges, you have to, because um, it's flexible, but it's also restricting. So you, uh, at times, most often than not, you go and read um, uh, the Scala GS SBT plugin code to understand what's going on. Um, there is also a, um, a language, a lingua of Scala GS that you need to grasp. For example, GS native, to, uh, uh, to have this facade wrapping around uh, uh, JavaScript. JS any, which means you bring something, you don't care what it is, it's like object. There is JS dynamic, there is JS object. Things that the documentation is absolutely comprehensive. You just need to go and read every time that you need. Just don't be shy. Weirdos. There is a little bit of weirdos when you're working with Scala GS. I didn't find them too many, nothing major. Um, as an example, for example, um, if you would like to call the Scala GS based API with var args, the only way that you can do it will be with apply dynamic, and even then you have to cast. It's doable, but it's not seamless. Um, another uh, gotcha that I found that um, Scala native function does not exactly equal G to G GS function, which means if you want to provide a callback, JavaScript-based callback that will be called in your Scala GS code, you can't put it in your shared part of the code because it won't be the same function. Okay? You'll have to wrap it around this JS function and then to say, okay, this is how you do things in JavaScript. Hopefully it makes sense. I see by the, by the looks, what is she talking about? Okay, wish list. Um, wish list, um, one theme that um, is reoccurring all the time, right now Scala GS emits one thing. You can't modularize it. It means that it's, uh, it's not big by the way, but it's, uh, it's not modular either, and it's something that, uh, um, people in the real project would like to have different models coming out of the uh, Scala GS code. Um, what I found in my project, and maybe I didn't look it into too deep, um, if you use Scala GS minimization, it actually conflicts with the standard front -end assets pipeline. My front end developers complained about not being able to understand what the variables when they try to debug their way and not my way. Yeah, Scala style support does not exist, unfortunately. So we had to strip Scala style support from uh, whatever Scala GS project uh, they had. So it's Scala style. It's good because you can. It's even. I mean, it's it's not about type safety, but it's about um, a guardrails for better code. It does. It's not supported currently by Scala GS. And um, as of a couple of months ago, I would say there was a lack of NPM support. You had to go a little bit through hoops to have your JavaScript output put by grant, wrapped it in NPM, and all the things that you didn't want to deal with, you had to deal with in order to create NPM package. There is a new initiative from, uh, uh, from Scala Center, actually, um, that, uh, as it provides this NPM support. It's, uh, 0.2.4, but it works and it's beautiful. Now, we have one minute left. The question is, uh, if we have another five minutes for live coding demo, do we or you want to go to lunch? I need, how many want to see live coding demo? It will be fast, I promise. 
Thank you. Okay, so the guy that I put here, it's actually last night I was uh, eating alone till uh, Jessic um, uh, joined me. And he told me that actually instead of a lot of live coding demo, uh, I need to explain my shit first because uh, not many people know about Scala.js and I totally grateful to him because um, what happened after a, a quick uh, question, uh, um, it's indeed so. So hopefully it was beneficial before, before we're going to live coding demo. So let's try. So what we have here, it's actually, let's, uh, okay. Our live coding demo will be, if I will be, to debug an application. So my application, it's very, very um, simple. It has two components. I have a client side, which is uh, written in uh, Scala.js, and I have server side, which you are not supposed to care about what it's written in. It was, and the, the, the idea is that in my application, when it starts, when I do refresh, it gets the, uh, the list of pictures, of popular pictures of Lublana. Okay, and right now, as you can see, something fishy going on, okay? If it was JavaScript, what I would do, I would go in through and go through the code, right? Till I find the bug. Probably that what I need to do as well in my code, but let's see what the difference in experiences will be. So, uh, no, it was not my intention. I was supposed to go to presentation mode. Okay, so if I go for a sec to start from the entry point, I have my entry point, app.main. Right, it's how Scala.js starts. And I have DOM document. And what I do, I'm using React, the React facade. And I'm rendering the picture component, okay? So if we go to pictures, pictures component, this is a component. Whoever is familiar with React, uh, knows how it works. Whoever is not, the idea is that you have component and you have a kind of a um, Rx server that if it gets all the notification, it renders it uh, uh, once again and once again when it gets it, the backend, right? So we have object pictures. We have case class pictures and I'm going here with you. We have buggy application. We want to see what's going on. So case class pictures, there is some state, Probably I'm clicking on something. Okay, class backend. In class backend, I probably cannot click on picture, but there is no pictures right now, so it's not interesting. Let's see how I render it. There is some problem with rendering. So I'm rendering it. I'm rendering probably uh, the list, picture list and favorite list. Okay, going here, picture, and looks like I am rendering SRC and SRC. Once again, in picture we have ID, URL, SRC, and title. So far, so good. Picture list, I'm rendering SRC, PRC, title, and I will have loading picture if list is empty. But li my list is not empty, right? My list has some kind of thumbnails, but there is no picture, so it's probably not here. Okay. There is also a picture, com picture component, it's React, blah, 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 blah. Oh, I'm doing something that I suspect it's Node, but you're not supposed to care. And I'm calling it by uh, some data get, and on load, if status is 200, I'm parsing. And I actually, I'm trying to see here, I'm having it result data, I'm mapping a list of it, each one of the items to picture, okay? So I have two options. The first one to go and see if what I assume that I got from the server is right, or I can start from something more local. Maybe I can assume that the server is fine, but what's going on here is fishy. So I know picture gets one, two, three, four, five elements. And right now I'm getting one, two, three, three elements, right? And here, 
comes the goodie. If I was in JavaScript, I will have to go and see who is who. I'm in Scala. In Scala, it means I need to have ID, URL, SRC, and title not necessarily in the same order. ID will be ID. URL will be probably URL. And link will be probably SRC. Hopefully I save it. Let's go back here. Let's try to refresh. <gasps> Pictures. No, wait. One more thing. One more thing. Okay. So now I know I debugged the application that I that it it it, it was not as uh, uh, was not as hard. Now, what I would like to see, if I'm coming here, the uh, title is default. It's not good. I don't like it. So where does default comes from? This default probably comes from the title. So I need to put here the title. The title. Here comes a little bit of a caveat. Here, if I come to item, because it is JS dynamic, I won't know how it's called. It's called title or caption or whatever it is. Here, I do need to collaborate with my peers to know that title is a caption that they send, send me over. Yes, beautiful Lublana, nice place. Okay, last but not the least. I'm not a big fan of front end. I usually like the back end. So I'm not getting along too much with the React. I can kind of get along by it, right? So right now I have this thing, by the way, yeah, it's uh, everything in component, it's very reactive as well. It's the, the, the click that you saw. Now, I would like also to give, to give this title as a visible title. So it will be probably around thing of the image, right? This React component picture and I show the image, okay? What I need to do? I need to add some sort of H1, H2, H3, right? So I would add div, div, I would add h1 p title, and I will add my image here. Let's see if I got the number of brackets right. But I will make it beautiful, but it's kind of work. Okay, and this is the idea. When you do Scala GS, you have to understand a lot of different kind of moving parts, but the simple and very profound idea of having it type safe, besides a little bit of, of, of boundaries, a server client, it's there, and it's full-fledged Scala. Can you see the browser source code how it handled? Yes, so you want to see, for example, I don't know if, I think I set the maps here. Let's do inspect. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Console, it's, I usually do it just in Chrome, so I'm not sure, JavaScript debugger. Um, pictures, okay, good enough? Yeah, it is, it is. And by the way, of course, you can do like, you know, Oh, the, there is war. And if I'll run it, it will be hit and you can see oh, the things. Code. Code? Huh? Code. Oh, it's color code. You want to see the JavaScript code. Okay. No, wait. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I almost misled you. Why do you want to see uh, compiled by, by, by some machine uh, or to generate a JavaScript code? Yeah, what exactly? Yes, but it's a compiler that took, took care of it. What you are interested as a developer in the code that you wrote, why do you want to see the generated code? I can show you, but it will be, it will be generated code. Don't, don't you use the generated code for debugging and finding sophisticated errors of the UI? How do you debug it? 
No, if you can, so this thing it's actually because ScalaJS can provide you with maps. It maps back, maps back from JavaScript to this code. So it's actually, it's instead of you as a human trying to relate, no wait, I see this generated code, how does it relate to my Scala code? It's been done for you automatically by providing these maps. That's why, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit confused and a little bit maybe even look aggressive, but I'm not because I'm, uh, I'm confused. Yes. Hmm? Three questions? Okay, let's try. Okay, so yeah, so um, it took me, so this one is, as, as you saw, it's very, very, it, it's a small, so it took, um, a, a, it took a small amount of time. Usually it takes around a couple of seconds for, for the big, for the production kind of great for the thing. Whole project, right? Yeah. Mm, uh, second question How large is the generated JavaScript code compared Se to equivalent code written by hand? Uh, by hand, I don't, I don't know, but I know that for, for the, once again, it's, uh, it's um, around several hundred kilobytes. It's, uh, the idea is that whatever you generate in the, 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 the ScalaJS, the, the, the executor itself, it's, um, it adds several hundred of kilobytes. It's rarely, I never uh, hit uh, one meg. And uh, the last question. When I want to, uh, uh, if I want to start a completely new project and I want to write it in Scala completely, do I have to touch a uh, stuff like Bower and Grunt? No. Excellent. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this information. Uh, if, if, even if uh, this was the only thing I learned at this conference, it was worth visiting. Really. Thank you. Okay, so in, in this case, um, let me just add one sentence. It's probably me, Enterprise Architect, kicked in. When I see new frameworks and the number is zero point whatever, I understand there is no one single chance that I will be able to pursue anyone to get it because zero six point thirteen er. but when it's come to EPFL, people tend to say, okay, but for the third party, it's probably it's uh, problematic. But yes, it may be production ready technically. <laughs> it, no one wants to, to, to talk about this, but no one wants to touch it. It's like works, don't touch. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a copy, um, copy paste uh, SBT user. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> 